right, so let's get started over here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Saman Amarasinghe. Was that close enough? Pretty good. Uh, sorry. <laughs> T uh, is leading the compiler group at MIT, and um, you may know him for Petabricks, for Dynamo, Rio, or um, for Streamit, or some other projects that he's led and uh, are well known in the community. He's got his um, master's from Cornell, right? Oh, sorry, the, 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 was your undergraduate, undergraduate. the bachelor's, and yeah. both master's and PhD from Stanford. Um, so it's all yours. Okay, thank you. So thank. So I am doing a small bait and switch in the title. So the title that was advertised was probably a lot more interesting, but it's almost the same material, exactly the same material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with telling th three side stories. These are kind of interesting experiences that has led to this uh, uh, language and compiler I'm going to talk about. And then, uh, the, but on the other hand, this, this is a lot more general global view of, I think, the, where the world uh, stands with respect to high performance. And then three observations that actually directly led to the language. And I have a bunch of material. Let's see how much I can cover uh, within an hour. So the first side story is about uh, uh, basically how to get, uh, uh, how the current programmers deal with performance. So if you look at uh, today's programmers out there, for last uh, uh, 10, 20 years, they have been very happy in the world they got. Most of them was completely oblivious to the processor their code was running. Uh, because Moore's law gave the all the performance needed for your average programmer. So I call him the average program, the Joe programmer. And, and for them, every year, about 50, 60% improvement in performance was good enough. And that more than was uh, good enough, and, and, and they were pretty happy. And what that means is that it, they were able to build a solid boundary between hardware and software. And if you look at something like Java, it basically abstracts out everything about hardware from the program. You don't even know where your program is going to run. It's going to run in some, some machine out there. And that was really nice for these people. This abstraction provided a lot of freedom for this average program. They were able to build very complex programs and worry about uh, uh, features of the program, not where it's running and how kind of performance they are getting. So this is where the average programmer was. And then there are in things like research labs, there were few people who really care about performance. These were like few, even less than a percent probably out there. And these guys were the ones who really was going all the way down, dealing with hardware issues and trying to get all this performance. So this world view was really well. For 99% of the people, they could just, just live outside, uh, uh, not think about performance. So this was made possible basically by Moore's law. So it's, in a talk like this, obligated to show this slide there. So what uh, this shows is that every 18 months, the number of transistors keep doubling. That's what the Moore's law says, basically. And for about, uh, yeah, I need to probably update this slide, but 2005, I have the processors in there. And this line has continued in here. Unfortunately, what has happened was, till this, uh, till about 2005, this line basically tracked the performance. This is the spec and performance uh, uh, of all these machines. So as you double the transistors, we actually got this performance also doubling uh, uh, for a while. And what has happened is now this is slowing down. But the, before I go why it slows down, I want to basically look at this phenomenon about this performance. So all of you, and especially most of my lifetime, I have lived in this life where every uh, 18 months performance doubles. So we have gotten huge amount of performance in here. So the first question is, when we have excess of something, no matter what it is, people normally squander uh, most of it. So how have we squandered the Moore's dividend? So uh, uh, the key thing is we have gotten about 10,000 X performance gain in th these 30 years. And where did it go? I mean, are we using it? I mean, of course, if you look at the modern uh, software, we, are, we have a lot of them that be useful, but there are a lot of things that are actually wasted. So if you look at the last decade, we concentrated heavily on everything except performance. And we looked at things like correctness, programmer productivity, 
and, and that is where all the research was done, that is where a lot of teaching was done and, and if you look at languages, tools, all those things reflected basically everything except performance. In fact, software engineering is probably the only engineering discipline out there where performance and efficiency is not the central theme. If you go talk of the way we do software engineering to some, somebody like a mechanical engineer or civil engineer, they will think you are crazy that those fields are all about doing more from less resources. And we are basically ma mainly about doing less with more resources. So, so and, and the interesting thing is, this is really reflecting through our entire community. So, so I teach uh, uh, software engineering course. So, at some point, I was looking at all the things I am teaching our students and said, wait a minute, let me see how I can do some of these things we talk about. So, so I just took matrix multiply and said, look, uh, I had bunch of lectures about immutable types, dynamic dispatch, object oriented programming, all done very nicely. This is what our students are learning these days. And probably a lot of you are, have, this is what you are learning. I said, okay, let, I take matrix multiply. I will use all these great concepts and write that matrix multiply. So, I did. And I ran uh, uh, what, uh, this 2K by 2K matrix and I got a number. This is in fact shows it's pretty darn slow. So, I said, okay, this does not look good. And immutable types is not something you want to do in matrix multiply because it makes the n cube algorithm n to the power 4 because you, you have to keep uh, uh, copying the matrix. That is not nice. So, what I said, okay, I get rid of immutable types and suddenly I get a 220x performance improvement. Okay, this is probably. Uh, where probably most people will stop, uh, start probably, they won't probably do immutable types. And they said, look, I was doing this nice class hierarchy with dynamic dispatch because I want to have different type of uh, uh, matrices in integers and floats and stuff like that. I said, wait a minute, matrix, you don't need dynamic dispatch. Most of matrices are basically uh, double, so just, just do one type in there. And when I do that, I get another uh, uh, 522x. And then I said, objects. Matrix is a matrix. I mean, it's just a nice two-dimensional array. You don't want to have these fancy objects here. Get rid of objects. Uh, uh, another get now uh, uh, another uh, two x improvement. Now, basically, what I have done is gotten rid of all the things I was teaching in that uh, class. Uh, 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 so back to very simple language in here. And then I said, okay, we might as well like just get rid of the language itself. Why do I'm teaching Java? Why do I do Java? Let's go to C. And to my surprise, just copying that exact, almost exact piece of code to C gave me just 2.1x performance improvement. So it's like, wow, this is interesting. Hmm? No, I mean, Java is doing a good JIT compiler. On the other hand, I have done this in, in like things like Python and, and, and PHP and JavaScript. That gets like a couple of thousand x uh, <laughs> difference. So, so, but, but uh, uh, see, so this is in here. So at this point, I said, wait a minute. This is interesting, but. When I was a graduate student long time ago, there was huge amount of emphasis in getting good performance. We actually went and hacked uh, the code to get good memory system performance and stuff like that. I said, okay, let me, let me try to remember how we did all those things in old, good old days. And did things like, and if you are doing matrix multiply, if you transpose a matrix, you get unit stride in one matrix. Okay, you transpose one, you get another 3.4x performance. Then you tile for cache locality, you get another 1.7x performance. You vectorize, you get another 2.8x performance. Uh, you prefetch, you get another 2.7x performance. At that point, I start using the blast library because I didn't want to write prefetching code by hand. And then finally, get parallelization. At that point, I got 3.5x performance. The interesting thing is where I started. I am having a, a, a 296,000x performance gain for this part of transfer. So, basically comparing a typical software engineering approach, very high level, object oriented, all these nice cool things we are teaching everybody and what they are practicing these days to what a good performance engineer would do, uh, basically looking at, at every ounce of performance, looking at all the architectural details and getting really good performance, huge difference. So, a lot of times when I ask these people, the people are surprised how much it is. In fact, matrix multiply is probably not your typical thing that every program you can do, but this is huge. So, I want to figure out, okay, how huge this is. I just compare and a lot of times when you look at performance, we look at power. Power is interesting uh, or energy. So, if you look at energy, if you look at miles per gallon difference between this super tanker, which is the gallons per mile versus this wind, it's only 14,000. In fact, if you want to compare, you need to have uh, uh, 20 super tankers to compare. So, if you think about it, if somebody comes with the technology saying, look, I can run 20 super tankers with the same amount of fuel required to run this 
small thing should be a revolution. I mean, we solve the world's energy crisis. And this is the kind of things we are, at least in matrix multiply in this example, we are just wasting. So the first thing is there's a lot of performance out there should be had. And the kind of the stack we have built though, so if you look at it today's uh, uh, machine, how we are running, uh, 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 the bottom was we have the hardware, and then we put a virtualization layer on top of that, on top of the running operating system, on top of that you are running a browser, on top of running you are running an interpreter, on top of running up like a JavaScript. I mean, if you look at that layer, I mean, we are just wasting huge amount of uh, resources in it. And, and so, so the first key thing is, is even though we, do, we feel like we don't have any performance to gain, we have a lot that we left behind. So if, if you think about when you look at the next system, we redesign them well, we will actually be able to gain a lot. So the reason that we had to do that is, as I alluded to here before, your performance start flattening out, and then now basically this has flattened, and in fact it's almost going down for the single core performance. So we are not getting single core performance anymore. So you can't just wait for a year and say, look, I wrote the program, it's running slow, wait till the next generation machine, it will run fast. That's what, what used to be, it's not going to work anymore. So there's no performance gains we are getting, and performance has to come from somewhere else. So if you want performance, you better use something like better languages. You need to be a lot disciplined programming. You can't just use excessive uh, things in here. And or you want to do performance engineering. So you want to actually really engineer uh, your program for performance. And of course, the other way of getting performance is parallelism. So what has happened is Moore's law has morphed in to uh, uh, basically providing performance by parallelism. Because now every generation, what's happening is you're not getting additional performance, but you're getting additional cores. So now every 18 months you double the number of cores you are getting. So if you want performance, you better use those cores. And so now the key thing is performance is parallel. But uh, the problem is this is really hard. Because you look at, the, take these programmers who are completely oblivious to performance. And now we say them not only you have to deal with performance, you have to deal with parallel. You just have double van. They just have to basically go all the way down and deal with all this complexity. So putting it more pictorially, so right now we have this performance oblivious programmers, nice flat road, uh, uh, no issues in there. And we said, oh, yeah, okay, you ran, uh, you had done nice 20 years on a flat road, now go climb this mountain to the bike. And that's basically what we are giving them because we, had to, we gave all the problems direct to the programmer. said, okay, you worry about all those issues. The interesting thing is, is there a better trajectory? So something that will say, we'll never get the flat, flat trajectory you can just say, you can't say, those good old days are gone. So you, you can't just ignore it. But can you ask them to do something less than dealing with every problem? So one thing we have been looking at is, is can we ask programmers to deal with concurrency? Tell we ask where the parallel, the, you can run parallelly, but you don't have to do all the performance optimization. We, in the compiler, we will try to get it. So we are trying to try, find the right middle ground, because I don't think, this is going to work anymore, and this is not sustainable, and we have, have a better picture somewhere. So one way to do this is basically separate uh, 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 the world in there. So first is uh, a parallelism extraction. You want to get uh, uh, things in parallel. Uh, the interesting thing is most of the times programs are written to simulate something in the real world, and real world is actually parallel. And, and can we get, I think there are a lot of natural parallelism out there. That by the time we write a program in a language like C or Java, we just basically obscure it. And can we get that without obscuring? And also, there's need for parallel thinking. Things like theory, algorithm, data structures, uh, basically has to be thought to uh, in a parallel way. I'll get back to some of these points a little bit later. And then there's a parallelism management. Once we know the parallelism available, uh, we need to map and get good performance. That, I think, is something the compilers can do. The key thing in here is, uh, let's, when there's parallelism, let users provide that. If there's no parallelism in, uh, available, just you should go home. That program is not going to give you parallel performance. That, I mean, th that's, that's a non-starter. But at least the easy thing, let the programmers express that, and then let's build a system where we can manage it and actually lead to good performance. So that's the basically uh, the app, uh, uh, big motivation for a bunch of my work. So next story that I want to talk about, this uh, side story, is future proofing software. Okay? So uh, 
ah, this style sign out of order. So let me, uh, uh, okay, let me go in there. Uh, uh, so if you look at the Joe programmer, if they wrote a program in, say, 1970, the program will still work. And it will not only work, it will work faster. And what happens is these programs are still running uh, 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 faster because it's, it's wrote to the same, uh, uh, basically, abstract machine models, or simple von Neumann model. And it still works fast. And, and because now machines are much faster, we'll run. Except what's happening is, is the new programming models out there is not the simple von Neumann module. They are these multi cores And these things keep changing. And the new reality is these machine models are going to keep changing a lot. And, and if you write a program for today's multi cores it's not going to work in tomorrow's uh, multi cores because they are a bit different. So future proofing programs for Joe is suddenly become really hard. And if you, I'm going to go back in my slides for some reason. So what happened is if you look at a, a program in the, one of those research labs I talked about, they had this issue for the longest time because they were trying to get the last ounce of program, uh, performance. And what that means is every time there's a new machine, they had to target that. So at some point, it was a vector machine, so they, they vectorized the code. The next time, they got a shared memory machine, so they did uh, open MPI or something like that. Then they got a distributed memory machine, they wrote MPI. So they have been having these issues of, of basically uh, porting programs every year after year, and that's a huge problem. So basically, put it, putting it basically more software last 30 plus years, most of the time. And in, if you go to a research lab, a lifetime of a, a computer system is less than six, six years, and every three years you get a new system. And every three years you have to port, and very soon the kind of program atrophies, because the, the original program was written beautifully by a physicist, and some guy hacked it, and somebody else hacked it after about three, four levels of hack. It just, the original meaning is very hard to uh, figure out. And, and, and this is reflected here, whereas if you look at something like, uh, uh, production code <laughs> on, on the, the user space. Like, if you look at even the latest Microsoft software, if there's a vulnerability here, you see that same vulnerability exists in Windows XP. That means 20 years ago, that was there. That means the same piece of code still survived. I mean, that's very difficult to do in the new year. You can't write a piece of code and expect it to survive a long time ago. So, so, uh, so what happens is there's no single machine model anymore. Uh, be, uh, between processor types keep changing, between generations keep changing, be, because this is the first time uh, exponential is exposed to software, which is the number of cores. Beforehand, the number of transistors was not exposed to software. We didn't care about it. But now the number of cores are exposed, so the software has to deal with something, doubling, uh, 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 probably every two years. And that's a really big change. In so. How do you do what we did to Java for performance? For Java, we said right once to run every day. So we got portability. We got uh, functional portability. Uh, but we need to get performance portability. And this is a really, really hard thing. So why this is hard is this, every time when you decide the language, there's this big tension. One thing you want to do is, of course, right now you want to get really good performance. So the way you get good performance is you expose a lot of architectural details all the way down. You said, okay, I will expose everything you need to get good performance. And so you can do that. You can write the program, and it will run really, really hard. And what that means is you, are, you kind of get into a local minima. And if the next machine is somewhere here, there's no way you can just get out of and get there. You need a heroic effort. There's no way you can do it automatically because you might not even have information. For example, if you look something like MPI, uh, message passing interface that basically exposes all the granular uh, stuff about the uh, uh, machine, all the hierarchy and stuff like that. You program for that. It was beautifully today, but tomorrow it will not work at all. That's the hard part. On the other hand, if you try to do something much higher level, you can try to hide those architectural details. But if you got too high, you are above the clouds, you don't see the landscape. So you might land at, at probably top of a mountain than actually uh, in the bottom because you don't see what's going so a lot of languages that things like list languages, all those things that raise the level of abstraction too high, never able to get good enough performance. So the, those the programs lasted forever because they were not tied to anything. But on the hand, they never gave any good performance either. 
So things like in high performance area, high performance Fortran, the beautiful language, you have lots of abstract constructs and <coughs> you will uniformly run slow no matter what. And so that's how they experience. So to be effective and future proof, you have to do this, this very delicate balance. You have to restrict choices when a, a, a property is either hard to automate or constant across architecture. Because if something is constant, if, if every architecture is going to do the same thing again and again, you don't want to abstract it out. It doesn't serve you any purpose by abstracting it out. Just expose it to the user. If you actually look at a language like C, it did a beautiful job of basically on all the von Neumann architectures, hiding out the difference of these, like the type of registers out there, calling conventions, stuff like that, but exposes common properties because one instruction at a time executed secret. I mean, all those things got exposed. The control flow got exposed in there. On the other hand, if there's something automatable and variable, which means you think you are varying between machines, you hide it from the user. And languages like C, you hide it from the user, hoping you can automate some things like register location. On the early com uh, lang uh, compilers are not that great, but as people went, they, they become better and better, and at some point, they became even better than uh, compilers. I mean, a person can do by hand, compilers became better. So the key thing is finding that balance. And that's really critical, and, and, and I think going forward, we need to do that well. So the third interesting story, uh, I will say before I get into uh, uh, what we were doing, is the evolution of programming language. How do we get there? The reason I am going to talk about it, I want to motivate the fact we need some new languages, and why. So if you look at the first computers out there, they were very limited in power. In fact, one of the most complicated things or the most daunting task those computers did was the compiling the program. So you had to make the language of the compiler easy. You can't make the compiler too difficult. So the way you make the life of a compiler easy is create these languages that didn't give you that many choices for the compiler. You say, okay, tell the compi compiler exactly what the machine has to do, and the compiler can do it, and we'll be good. So what that means is, is when you have algorithm, instead of giving anything high level, you told the compiler, go do this, do this, do this, in this very specific way, I'll get the result. So you just gave them exactly one algorithm, exactly one way to iterate uh, through the program, one data layout. If you do parallelism, one parallelism. It worked beautifully. So, so it, you, you, you found the, you see, assume your brain, you know, bunch of ways to solve in the problem. You found what you thought is the best way of doing that and directly mapped into, this is the space of the program, you know, assume this is, uh, green says run really fast, red yeah, things right. run slow. Right. You found a good enough space that, that you can run that program and, and map it in there. Sort of, yeah, do this this way. You'll get good performance. And you got good uh, performance that you cared about. So what happened was as time progressed, uh, computers became powerful. And what that means is compilers can do more things. So we said, yeah, that's what you use us. But let me try to figure out there's something better you can do for this program. Can you run faster? So what you did was, from the space that was provided, you start looking around it. Okay, can you have a better register allocation strategy? Can you have a better memory layout strategy? You look for different things, trying to find a better path in there. So, so in, within that space, you can find something better. So this is where we start. But in the last decade, what happened was, when you look at uh, optimizing compilers, we had a lot more compute power. So there, what we decided was, okay, we are, now we need to find a lot more things to do. So we start doing heroic analysis. So the idea there is uh, 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 the language is, uh, was giving you this one way of doing that. What we are trying to do is other possibilities. We are trying to expand, expand, expand. But the problem is just the choice of writing the program. You have eliminated a lot of knowledge. So the program had a lot of ideas in their head. But by choosing this one, a lot of those things are not now available, not available to the system. So we had heroic analysis. but even doing that, there's limited things you can do. So this is where we decided we need to read the language. So the way we uh, approached this thing was twofold. One said, okay, if you know multiple ways of solving this problem, okay, we can basically ask you to give all these different ways. And what that means is we ask you to express the intent of the pro uh, program, not a method of solving it. Just tell me what you're trying to solve. Don't tell me how to solve it. I will, by telling you that, but, uh, for example, by giving an example, I can figure out that. The other important thing we did was uh, 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 figure out muscle basically outpaces brain. 
uh, at least the computers on on Moore's slow and then it, it uh, something keeps doubling every 18 months whereas the human brain is still what it was 40 years ago we haven't doubled our capacity so don't make your all the problem in your head use something that actually gives you more and more performance so how do you do those things so that basically led to uh, 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 petabase so the theme of telling stories so I'm going to tell you uh, three direct observations that that led to the language first is algorithmic work so I'm a compiler guy I take somebody's program and make it run really fast if I can and after I do all these crazy transformations and get it run fast in my machine I'll go talk to probably the who wrote the uh, uh, algorithm or some other numerical guy and say look look what I can do with this algorithm I can run this fast and a lot of times they will look at it and say wait a minute if you are trying to do it in that machine I won't use that algorithm that's another thing that will actually do much better in that article. And that's really frustrating because I do all this work and they say it's useless. I can just, I will do something different. So what that means is the realization that as we go about solving a problem, there are many solutions. And some solutions are better under some circumstances. So for large input size, you might want to do something. others, For example, if you look at parallelism, there's nothing called uh, absolutely best algorithm no matter what in most problems. In and, and so because of that, how do you take advantage of that? This becomes even a bigger issue when you go to multi-close because multi-close expose this exponential parameter out, basically number of cores. So best algorithm for two cores, one core is not the best one for four cores, definitely not for 16 and not for 1,000. So algorithms have to keep changing. And so if you pick one, you're kind of stuck in one data point and we have to avoid that. So basically, there's no single algorithm that can solve all cases. So we had to deal with that at the language level. So that's the first observation. Second one, actually, what I alluded to a little while before, the world is parallel. And many people have figured this one out. So if you look at mathematicians, they describe things parallelly. They have a set notation, sigma, simultaneous equation. This is very nice parallel way of describing that. For some reason, the computer scientists decide parallelism is hard. From the early time on, they said, okay, we will come up with this sequential abstraction that will simplify our life. Everything we do in theory and everything is basically to sequentialize the world. So ex statements execute sequentially. If you do a set, we said, oh, it's a loop. It's not a set. It goes to one to n. We choose order. We put order. Even a recursive definition. We say, okay, if you're given fn, we, will, we can give you fn n plus one solution. We just took a very parallel world and imposed it. And this worked one for a while. It uh, let us limit complexity in many problems. But now it's really coming to bite us. And we had to really redo that. And some of it is not that difficult. So what, uh, when I look at a lot of programs, I find the problem statement very parallel. You write, sequentialize it in C, and you're asking the compiler to reparallelize it. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. So how do you make natural parallelism easy? So what the idea there is, make parallelism the easiest way to describe something may sequentiality harder than parallel. So sequentiality should be a special case that you have to work a little bit harder to get than the other way around. <laughs> the third observation was when I start writing compilers, we had a model for everything. We knew what hardware was. We have, there's a processor, we knew exactly how the processor works in there. We had a nice model, Intel or IBM or whatever, Sun or SGI told us what it does, and we knew what the compiler did. These days, systems are way too complex. Sometimes Intel doesn't even know what their processes are doing. You ask some people there, they say they are get surprised what happens in the process. And the compiler, something like GCC, has 30 plus passes. It's really hard to know if you do something early, what's going to happen later, why it's doing something. And there are a lot of subtle interactions going all over the place, and there are thousands of knobs in there. But computers are cheap. And in fact, we have all these parallel resources. So instead of trying to come up with this complex model in our head, why don't you do end-to-end -end execution, observe it, and using machine learning to figure out what's going on. So how can you basically use machine learning to simplify our life? That is basically uh, uh, the three driving forces behind Petabrix. So next part, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to describe the uh, uh, Petabrix language a little, giving example. Talk about the compiler, some results, and two extensions we have done uh, into the language. Uh, trying to give you a feel for where we are going. These are some still fairly early work, and and so uh, uh, you will see that in the.
So if you look at uh, uh, Petabricks in here, so here's a simple matrix model. So what it says is you get a matrix A, uh, parameterized, and you get matrix B, and you produce matrix AB, and the way you do it is you basically have this piece of code that, that calculates that, which is called a rule. And the rule says, I'm going to calculate cell uh, AB, and I don't tell you which cell it is. I don't give you any order. Say, I, all the cells has to be calculated this way. You figure out how to do it. And of course, you do it by basically taking a row and a column and doing dot product. So what I have done is given you an implicitly parallel description of uh, 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 basically matrix. I didn't, I didn't tell you what order, I, gave, I have freedom to do it any, any order I want. And then of course, if you, were, if you have to have a sequential uh, uh, constraint, I have to do some additional work here to say, okay, by the way, some of the orders are not something you can do. So, so I made the parallelism fairly easy. The next thing I said was, okay, if you know other ways to matrix multiply, tell that to, them to me too. So you can do matrix multiply by basically taking two regions uh, and doing two small multiplies and adding them together. Or you can do it by basically subdividing matrix in a different way and calculating uh, sub matrices in there. Or you can do it in other parts. There are multiple parts. In fact, if you give this one, our compiler will automatically generate these three. So you don't nearly have to give these three in here. You can do that. However, that's not all how you can do matrix multiply. There's a thing called a Strassen's algorithm that runs uh, uh, asymptotically better and that's very different. And I don't know a single compiler that given the simple matrix multiply that automatically can generate this. And the worst thing is this is not always the best way of doing matrix multiply. This has bad cache memory behavior. Sometimes uh, other blocking might be better. So, so there's no way in a modern language to get that point across. In Petabricks, you say, no, oh, here's another way of doing that. Okay, you figure out what works best, and that's what the compiler does. So basically, what we have done is made uh, um, algorithmic choice basically a key aspect of the language. We ask, we make it easy for programmers to give us multiple ways of doing that. And what compiler can do is use these multiple ways and figure out the right hybrid or basically poly algorithm that combines multiple algorithms together to get the best form. And that can change basically given different data, given different uh, um, uh, architectures, you can do something different. And also what we did was we made a language where we synthesize outer control flow. So basically uh, uh, we can do it by the rows, columns, diagonals, reverse order, parallel. We can do any different way we want and it's up to the basically uh, uh, compiler to figure that out. We don't try to undo one and do something different. We just made it completely easy to do that. So, that made our life much easier. So uh, uh, what pro we ask programmer to do is if there's some order we cannot do, tell us that. So sequentiality, give us additional information that we will uh, 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 drop some orders in there. And, and basically this allows compiler to explore this nice choice for us. So let me give you a little bit of a past background in what the compiler does and, 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 and walk through that. So in order to do that, I am going to do this by giving a small example. So this example is doing a rolling sum. Okay, so in order to rolling sum, I figured out two ways of doing a rolling sum. The first way of doing the rolling sum basically says, I want to calculate uh, 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 the sum here. And the way I calculate this uh, 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 sum from B is, is basically by taking previous B element and A and adding that. Okay, so I take this one, add, I take this one, add. So what this says is uh, I am calculating a, 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 a cell of I using a, a, a cell of A previous uh, cell here and, and um, A value and adding them together. I do that. Okay. The other way of doing a, a, a basically rolling sum is basically I can basically, each one, I can figure out what needs to be added and added them together. So obviously you will see the difference in here. This one has a lot less operation, but on the other hand, it's very sequential. I have to do this before I do this, and I have to do this before I do this. I have to sequentially go through that. This is a very parallel one. I can calculate all the sums parallelly, except I do a lot more operations here, because I am doing each, I am adding them together. So given different architecture, different situations, one might be better than the other. And, and that's what the, uh, the system is, is able to do, our comp uh, compiler. But this is how we describe that. So 
after you describe this program, the compiler basically go through some analysis. So to give you a kind of a rough feel what happens in here. So we do three kind of new analysis in the compiler, what we call applicable regions, choice grids, and turf dependency graph. The first thing we do is we made because we are giving these rules, the f interesting thing is most of the programs when you look at the complexity comes a lot of times in the boundary condition. So you have this nice matrix, you can do something, in the boundaries you have to do this very complicated. <coughs> so a lot of times, by the time you do the boundary condition, it really complicates your piece of code, it, but it doesn't matter. Boundary condition is something you don't care that much about performance. So it, performance matters in the middle. So by doing these rules, we let you write different rules. You can write some rules that only work for the boundary, other rules work for other areas, middle or vice versa. So in here, what we did was we wrote this rule. This rule only works for these three elements. Because to calculate an element, you need the previous element. So in there, there's no previous element. So this rule only applies to these three elements. Whereas this rule applies to all the elements. So at this point, you have a different ways of calculating the world. So what you find is, is you find the rules and figure out which part of the program that rule can be used to calculate, which part of the data. And, and by doing that, we can actually nicely separate out these these weird boundary conditions, you don't have to write one complicated mess in here. And the next thing what we do is divide the entire data set by rules. So we can say, wait a minute, this data item can we only use rule one to calculate. This data items can use both rule zero and one to calculate. So by doing that, I can say, okay, I, I, I do different set of analysis to calculate this item because I, I, I have different set of choices than here. So I divide the world uh, according to that. And then finally, I come up with a choice dependency graph. That basically says, given the region, what are the rules and what are the dependencies you can do. So, so in here, I can only use rule zero. Here's my dependency in here. Uh, uh, and, and for the others, I have two different rules I can do. So, so this gives you, a, uh, gives you a indication what is all the freedom that the execution have to get the result. So putting it all together, what happens is you first get your source program and Fedabix compiler will create this auto-tuning binary. So what that tells is, is here are all the things you can use and here are the dependencies you have to uh, adhere if you're using that. So some stuff, some rules you can do for all the data, some rules you have to wait till it satisfies certain conditions. So it will give you all the choices in here. And then what you do is you can do offline auto-tuning. So we use this, we run, we have a data generator also we ask people to provide. We generate data and keep running through all these rules, look at all the possibilities in here. And once you figure out a really good uh, uh, choices that will give you the best algorithm, basically we can recompile that in and create a final binary that doesn't have all these choices available. So you don't have all the choice over here. So our auto tuner basically uh, uh, use a generic tuner to find all these hard binary decisions and uh, NRE search algorithm when you have linear choices. For your block size, you had to search a, a linear space. And one interesting thing we do in our uh, uh, auto tuner is we start basically with very small data set. So if you have a matrix of two by two, you can try millions of different choices. And then we use the best set to basically see the next level of choices, larger matrix. So as you go to larger and larger problems, you don't have to uh, go through the entire space. You don't look at all the possibilities. We are not eliminating anything. We are basically giving it less probability. So for example, like blocking. A two by two matrix, just no blocking is very slow. You, you don't want to have a bunch of one by my entries. So at that time, the evaluation will say that's really bad and it will get a low priority. But as we go larger and larger and as you look, start looking at a matrix that uh, basically doesn't fit into L1 cache, suddenly when you try blocking, suddenly realize it's a good algorithm. It improves and it becomes, uh, it uh, goes into uh, the, the better algorithm. By doing that, we, we build, uh, and the reason for doing that is if we run a really bad algorithm in a really large data set, you can be there forever. So we want to make sure that we don't try really bad things that often, especially when you look at large things. So this bottom-up tuning actually helps a lot. So let me show you some of our early results. So here's sort. So sort is this classic algorithm. There are many different uh, ways of doing sort. And in fact, some stuff, something like insertion sort is really good when the data is small. But if there's a lot of data, things like radix sort becomes uh, 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 much better. 
And so what we can do is, and, and there's a lot more crossover at this point that you don't see. We can learn a, a basically a hybrid algorithm, it's a poly algorithm, that's better than everybody. What it does, it recursively goes down at that switch point, at different point it switches to different algorithms. Let me actually show you a little uh, uh, pictorially what type of things we do. So let's look at this four uh, uh, sorting algorithms, uh, uh, merge sort, insertion, radix, and quick sort. So poly algorithms is not new. If you actually go look at standard template library in there, there is in fact a poly algorithm. That's a merge sort, two-way merge sort, that at 15 elements switch to insertion sort. So very pretty impressed, like wow, these people have done that, and we said, wait a minute, why is 15? And then we were trying to figure out where did that come from, and we realized in like 1999, uh, it was introduced by SGI, uh, in SGI compilers uh, uh, STL library, that, and they picked 15. And still it's 15, because 15 <laughs> is, is a variable that is in the program. There's no way the compiler can change that. And so we said, does 15 make sense? In fact, something like 2,500 makes sense today because the, the caches are big and stuff like that. But still, it's 15. If you go look at your uh, STL library, there will be a constant that at 15 is going to switch. And, and so we said, okay, look. So instead of 15, if you actually do it right, what will happen? The interesting thing is if you look at something like Xeon 1 core, it will start with a radix sort for large data. And about 98, it will switch to a four-way merge sort. And then about 75, it should switch to an insertion sort. That's great. So that's what happened. But if you look at eight phase on, it's a very different strategy. What it will do is it will start with a uh, n-way merge sort, two-way merge sort, and about 1,200, because now it's parallel, switch to fixed sort, and about 600, it's switched to insert. It's a very different cutoff point. And something like Sun Niagara has a, even a different story. It has a very different memory system. So it never do anything other than merge sort. It do different size merge sorts at uh, uh, two, four, uh, eight, 16 merge sorts, cutting off at different places. So if you like uh, put them together, so here's the kind of eye chart in here. So what I show here is uh, uh, different architectures. Where this is the mobile core to duo and, and uh, different two uh, Xeon systems and one, one Sun Niagara. And here's the algorithm it creates. Like at infinite, it's a quick sort. And then it switched to a two-way merge sort at this one, four-way merge sort, eight-way merge sort, and insertion sort. So there are all these combination algorithms that are very different. The first question is, so how important is this selection? I mean, is there a big performance difference? So in order to uh, try that, we basically took each of the algorithms. So mobile algorithm means this one in here. And ran it on other systems and looked at the slowdown. So if you use this algorithm that's given here and ran it on a one-way Xeon, it runs about 60% slower. And if you run it on uh, uh, eight-way Xeon, it runs about 60% uh, uh, oh, slower. And if you took the algorithm tuned in Niagara and ran on a, we'll say, two years, it's 2.3x two, two So what that means is even if you look at architectures not, that are almost same generation, not that different, okay? If you actually go and, and tune it for a machine, there's a, almost a factor of two performances. This, not, you're not tuning that much. This is a, a simple architecture, a, a simple algorithm, but you, you get a huge difference. So if you look at something like matrix multiply, there are all these different ways you can do Strassen's uh, transpose, recursive, blocking, simple basic, and here's all the performance you get in here. And then what we can do is do a hybrid one that's better than everything. The nice thing about hybrid is it should always be at least the best you can get at that point. And, 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 and we should get into a place that, that is worse because you can always switch to that algorithm. And if you look at something like eigenvector solve, because this is recursively decomposing, you can keep switching algorithms as we go down, you can actually get a performance that's uh, uh, basically much better than everything else. So what happens is at the low end, it will set, set to QR, and then basically uh, it's set to DC in uh, 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 basically uh, after some point. So you get uh, that result. So these are some early results we are uh, writing a lot more benchmarks these days in here and try to get a uh, 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 better understanding of the language. So I want to now switch gears a little bit and talk about two different extensions. Let me see how much time I have that I can cover both. So the first one is variable accuracy. So we are used to this world where things look black and white. 
So, what we said was okay, if you have an algorithm, it will solve, it will give you one result always. But the world is not that simple. World is a place where there are a lot of shades of gray. So, things like iterative algorithm basically solves, it iterates a certain amount of times. At some point, somebody has to say, okay, this is good enough, I'm going to stop, I like this now. Or things like signal processing, things like images and sound. Okay, what's the perfect sound? Basically, if you hear well, you are happy and different people have probably different perception and, and so there are a lot of this give and take you can do, things like approximate algorithm. So many of these things you can trade accuracy for speed or saying given a certain amount of time what's the best accuracy you can get. So you have this trade off. So, uh, uh, so most of the times this is what all users want, solve this uh, certain accuracy as fast as possible uh, uh, using whatever you can uh, or vice versa, given a certain time give me the best accuracy you can get. So, so one interesting algorithm for doing this is called multigrid. So for people who probably don't know multigrid, I will do a quick intro into the multigrid. This is uh, using uh, uh, iteratively solving partially different e equation on a gridded domain. So you have a bunch of data points. So one way to look at, think about that is, assume you have a, a big sheet of metal and one place you put some heat source and you want to figure out how the heat is going to be propagated. The way you can do it is iterative is you divide it into a bunch of grid points and each point you basically average the near neighbors. And you do it and for every point you do that one iteration. So you have this heat will propagate a little bit and you do it enough times at some point you get the full propagation uh, the, of the heat. So, so if you do that and that's what you do. Uh, but you can do it uh, many different ways. So what one is called relaxation, update points using the near neighbor values. It's a stencil computation and sometimes if you have five points in a place you look at the your point and the four nearest neighbors and you up update that. But that takes a long time because if you think about a large sheet, the, every step the heat will propagate one pixel, one pixel, one pixel, slowly propagating all the way. So to get through a large thing, it takes a very long time to do that. The other way people can do is what they call restriction and interpolation. So instead of saying I have very fine a grid because in fine a grid result, why don't first basically uh, uh, course in the grid? And, and what you do is, is uh, 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 then you have much fewer points and that value will propagate very fast through that. And then after it propagates through that, you can again uh, do uh, uh, interpolation and, and make a fine refinement. So what happens is you have a very uh, 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 fine resolution in here and you relax to basically co to come up with a coarse resolution here and then at some point you relax a lot in here. And then once you are happy with that, you can basically go and again interpolate into the final grid you want. So when you of course get the value from here to here propagate in like two steps, here it will take a lot more steps to propagate. So in the field, there are papers published on how to do that. There are things called V cycles, W cycles, full MGV cycles, all these things are papers. Say, okay, start with this resolution, go down, down, come up, or go down, down, come up a little bit, go down. So all these things are so basically each of these shape is a paper. So, so the, there are a lot of questions. So, what relaxation operations do? How many iterations to run this thing? Uh, how close we can do? All these uh, uh, steps we can do. So, so there are three main things you can do. At some point, if you have small amount of data points, you can do a direct solve. You can write a system of equations and solve that and say the exact result for this. And if that, if it is too many data points, you do uh, interact. Or you can iteratively solve something. You can run iterations again and again and again. Basically, do do this uh, SOR type thing, so success or relaxation. Or you can recursively go to a smaller, uh, uh, coarser grid, do something in here, come back up. And and uh, 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 so you have this standard V shape, and then at some point you can go do a direct solve in here, uh, uh, in there. Or you can do direct solve a little bit, go up, and and then you can do all this kind of uh, uh, iterate over that. And also when you iterate, you have to figure out how many times you're going to iterate. So this is, I hope I gave a very fast uh, overview of what this algorithm is about. So what happens is what you get is this trade-off between accuracy and time. There are a bunch of algorithms that will give you a result with certain accuracy, taking certain time, and, and, and you get this two-dimensional space. Interesting thing is this side is better, that with higher than accuracy. So you don't want something get low accuracy and running long time and that's not that great. So what you need is actually this optimal frontier. So this is what's most important for you. So these are the algorithms that basically beat uh, accuracy versus time and of course you want everything. It depends on the amount of accuracy you want, you can trade off that. 
And so what happens is there are a lot of these algorithms in here, so it's too hard to remember everything. So what we can do is we can uh, quantize this space and say each quanta we will give you one algorithm in here. So remember this one for each of these quantas. That's the best algorithm to do that. So what we have done is we use dynamic program to manage this auto tuning. We search through these shapes and 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 figure out the optimal for that size in here, and we can build up in here. So if you look at what's going on. Our program looks like this. Uh, what the program has is a uh, base direct solver in here, uh, uh, in there, and then we have iterative solver uh, uh, that we can do, and then we can call recursively, uh, uh, go down and solve and come back up here, and all those things have number of iterations that are also learned. But it says run for as much as you think it's good. That's our loop. We don't tell you how much. You say figure out what's good. Run that many amount of times. Give me the answer. And so what we have generated is bunch of uh, language extensions. So for example, we have variables that are saying, okay, I don't assign a value. You figure out what best for this variable. And we have accuracy metric that, that when you're measuring, you tell me how to measure your accuracy of this program. Mm -hmm. And some of time it might be very simple things like uh, 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 average or, 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 or mean squared error, or you can write your fancy accuracy metric. And then, of course, you can say how many quantization you do. And of course, you need a data generator. So we can generate enough test data to run that. So this is what we're asking for the programmer. And then we will do what's right. So what happens is when you're training, you will find each algorithm for each of these bins for one resolution in there. And for next resolution, we will construct algorithms using these as our, our building blocks and, and construct one. So, so we will get all these data points with only algorithm build out of these ones. So, and then some of these things will be the best in this region, and we'll get that. So each resolution, we'll use the previous resolution's values to build a, build a set of algorithms. So what happens is, if you look at it, what happens is uh, this level of algorithm might only use uh, 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 basically uh, uh, the higher level algorithm in here. So for example, we'll say uh, uh, we will do this in final, and we'll go to 2x, uh, uh, run two times this one at some level by coarsening it and then use that result. So, and then to get to the higher level, you basically, you have all these choices and it's say, wait a minute, run this one time, <coughs> run this two times, and then probably direct solve and go back up. So resolution you mean twice the grid is twice as big? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So basically, assume I have a grid of 4096, you can say, okay, that means accuracy 10 to the seven, and then you, you want a less accurate solution for a, a smaller grid, run it twice at this accuracy, run sometimes, go to even less accurate, run, run, and course on it. At some point, when you are small enough, I can do direct solve, and I can go back up. So I can, I can do this very combination. That's the best algorithm in here. So what happens is we come up with this crazy shape, different shapes for different algorithms. We can figure out, okay, given the accuracy, given the size of data, what's the best way to go through that space? And we can learn that. And that's a really cool part of that. And, and also, because we are using this optimal substructure, these things get repeated in, in, in a larger problem. This gets repeated multiple times. So here's one result in here because this is a two-dimensional result. It's hard to show everything for uh, for one accuracy uh, value in here. So you can have all these uh, uh, individual programs, but we will find something that basically hugs uh, the best of all, all the values. To give you uh, uh, another uh, view, this is another interesting algorithm which is bin packing. So if you get bunch of different sites of boxes, and if you have a bin to pack it up, the, the optimal solution is, is NP hard, just in there. But there are a lot of uh, heuristics that you can have. And some heuristics are very fast than others, and but they might not be that good. So what we are saying, showing here is that if you, if you want algorithm that, that only 50% uh, to the best you can get. There are very, uh, depending on the size, there are some algorithms that are really fast, will get you 50% of the best you can get. But on the end, if you want something to 10%, there are other algorithms, that like something like first fit, that will give you uh, close to 10% in this size, but it will take longer to run. So given uh, the, the, the accuracy you want and given the data size, you can say, okay, this is algorithm I want to run to get that. So I, we, I can learn that space. So it's a complex space, but, but this is what our learning algorithm is. Okay, so I think yeah, about 5% of so I'm gonna skip the next section. I don't think I have time for that, and, and, and let's directly go to conclusion. So I think it's time 
we come up with languages that are based on auto tuning. I think uh, uh, auto tuning is 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 try to take off. A lot of people have done auto tuning as libraries, but I think we need design language. So that's because there's this convergence of multiple forces. First of all, the multi-core menu. We have multi-cores, and we have no idea how to use it. And these things keep changing fast enough, and we have to find a way to do that. And the second thing is we want to future proof our program. We want to write a program once, and 10 years down the line, we want it to work. We had it for now, and but the way we are going with multi-cores, we are going to lose it, and if, unless we figure out some, some way of doing that. The other, I think the most interesting thing is we have a lot of muscle available today, compute muscle. Except we don't have a human brain is in the moon. And in fact, the compilers is what, and, 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 and programming languages is some we are everybody uses to take advantage of compute power, but we are the ones who are least users of compute power. If you look at things like CADs, tools, they are all embracing high performance computing. They are their tools run on large systems, they are doing beautiful visualization, all those things. In compilers, we are still running on one core and, and, and only parallel so we have done is at the make level. Or none of there's no single parallel compiler. We have parallelizing compilers, but none of the compilers itself are parallel. So the key thing is how can we compilers and this community use the compute power that we are trying to manage ourselves to actually uh, uh, make things better. And I, I think there's a lot more we can do if we embrace that and say, okay, look, we are going to use a lot of compute power. And in Petabricks, what we have showed is it can be done and, and, and it has benefits. However, it's not, the project is not far from done and it's not acceptable thing. There are a lot of questions to be answered. For example, we are asking people to do more work. Normally, you say, okay, get the first program, first algorithm written, written and get it working, and then write the second one and the third one. In these days, time to market is critical. It's very hard to convince somebody to want to get it finished to do some extra work. So, will people be able to do this? Say, okay, look, I will actually give you other options, even though my first option perfectly sufficient for my base needs. So, that's asking for extra. We're asking for extra. So the convincing people to do that, I think it's still up to there saying, okay, will the average Joe programmer that has a release deadline is going to give me other choices, so they are going to move on to the next thing, or how we do that. And also, now we take a couple of programs and build a very complex poly algorithm. How do you know it's correct? I mean, there's a lot of complexity in verification validation, and in fact, if you do dynamically, that every time you run, you run a different algorithm. And that, that's a nightmare for a lot of people. So one saving grace is what we found was, especially for uh, when you're not doing variable precision, we can compare each algorithms against each other. In fact, we found bugs. So if you write a new algorithm, it better produce the same results as the other ones we have. So when you're doing, uh, when you're doing basically learning, you're not only just looking at the time, we're actually looking at the results comparing, and we actually found a lot of bugs. Say, so, oh, wait a minute, that in that case, okay, some algorithm produces a different result, okay, something might be wrong. So we can actually use it for testing. But for verification validation, still up in there, what, how do you validate a poly algorithm that we are putting? So that's all I have. Uh, I'm open for questions. Okay. okay. Should we open up for some questions from remotely because they might have to leave soon? Okay. Remote people, questions? I know we have local questions, but if there are something more, that we Do they hear you? Yeah. They're sitting, they're paying attention. They might be hearing me, otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise they wouldn't be sitting there for hours. Okay, that's a question. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for the talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thanks for the talk. Uh, towards the end, when you were talking about variable accuracy, uh, variable accuracy computation, uh, how, how, how do you anticipate users reasoning about the various fields that they can specify for their particular code? Because in some sense, one of your examples had had a field where you had to specify the range of accuracy or accuracy quantiles. Um, do, do you have some tool that helps users to figure out exactly what those quantiles should be? So right now, the accuracy quantile is this optional thing. What we will do is we will look at the range of variable can get and basically chop it up to uh, pieces in there. And the accuracy quantile, that becomes important if you have like a non-linear kind of range where you have, so, so at, at, at this point, we don't have any tools. 
like that because lot of it is, is I think the semantics of the program. If it is a simple linear range, you don't need to specify that. But we have found some programs there. There are things like uh, uh, accuracy become very important in, in in certain ranges where you have to quantize it much more smaller versus other ranges. So so if you know more information about your program, we won't provide them with the tools to do that. But that's not that's optional. I think uh, thinking about some of this variable accuracy is can be hard, uh, but on the other hand, it might be liberating too because what we are asking you to do is tell us less. So instead of saying i equals hmm, how many times should I iterate, do whatever you want. So i equals one, instead of saying 1 to picking a number, I will say 1 to I will leave it blank. So in some sense, I think I am asking you to do less programming than more programming. So hopefully, uh, uh, this of course has to be proven. Uh, in practice, I, th I, th I think uh, this might be easier for the programmers because something like iterative algorithms, a lot of times people spend huge amount of time trying to figure out what is the right number of iterations. And here what we are saying is do not do it. 